I ask you to turn with me your Bibles just now to the passage that, from which we read this morning, uh, Acts chapter 4, uh, where we read up to verse um, 22. We want to pick up at verse 23 this evening um, and read through to the end of the chapter. John chapter, Acts chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 23. Speaking about the apostles who had been um, uh, briefly imprisoned, um, the, the, the word of the, the Pharisees and the religious, religious leaders of the Jews, uh, Luke goes on to say this, when they, that is the apostles, were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the, the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now the number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many were owners of lands or houses, sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus, Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Bar Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is God's word, and we'll come to consider that, this passage, um, in just a few moments' time. Let's again turn to God in prayer. Let's uh, remember uh, our needs of as a congregation, let's remember the wider needs of our denomination in these days, and let's continue to pray for our, our nation, not least with the general election coming up uh, on Thursday. Let's pray as we are commanded to pray for those who are our leaders, um, but that also in a democracy involves praying for the voters, uh, that the Holy Spirit of God will direct each individual as they cast their votes so that uh, the, the leaders of God's choice uh, will be given to us. It doesn't necessarily mean that we'll get the leaders that we, we think should be in office, um, but we will be getting the leaders that God, in his wisdom and in his providence, gives us uh, for good or for ill. Um, and sometimes we actually get the leaders that we deserve um, because of where our hearts lie rather than the leaders that we need. But let's turn to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you, as we've been reminded already this evening, that you are the sovereign Lord over nations. We thank you that even in those countries that embrace democracy as their system of doing politics, uh, democracy is ultimately under your sovereign direction. You are the one um, who moves the hearts of individuals. You are the, the one who moves even the hearts of the hardest atheist to cast their vote in a particular way uh, that the outcome of the whole voting procedure will reflect what your will and your intention is for particular nations at particular times. And Lord, we want to thank you that uh, even when there have been times when, when governments have been put in place that are anything but 
godly, anything but kind and caring, um, anything but the kind of um, wise leaders that, that we so much need, they're actually a judgment from God himself um, because we do not deserve good leadership because too often we have, we have abused the good government that we have had in the past and neglected and failed to support it. But Lord, we pray that whether it be for our local elections here in the province, uh, that you will direct us as we, um, as we vote for those who will represent us uh, in Westminster, um, or whether it be those who on the mainland uh, will be voted in from uh, Scotland and from Wales and from England uh, to occupy their seats in, in Parliament in Westminster. We pray, dear God, that you would give to us um, the government of your choosing and the government that ultimately will serve your wise and loving purpose um, to bring us to our senses as a nation, to make us realize the folly of our ways in so many of the choices that we have made over recent decades. We acknowledge again just how far we have drifted um, from the Judeo-Christian foundations upon which Western civilization has been built historically. Um, we do humbly pray that you would um, visit us afresh with an outpouring of your spirit so that even amongst those who lead us as parliamentarians, um, there would be um, an extraordinary um, outpouring of your grace and by your, of your spirit upon those who are perhaps atheists, um, who are hardened against you, um, who are irreligious, um, who have no sense of morality. We pray, Lord, that you would bring a great conviction upon them to see the futility of the ways of life that we have chosen for ourselves. And we pray that you will give them a glimpse of what could be if we sought to order our country and our lives and our international relations by the principles of truth and godliness that are found in Scripture. We pray, Lord, that you will go before us into this coming week to that end. We pray closer to home that you would continue to be with not only our own church, but each of our churches um, over these coming weeks as summer begins and people and families head off on holidays and perhaps numbers will be depleted um, for many churches over this period of time. We pray, Lord, that even though there will be occasions when we're meeting in small numbers, we pray that you would remind us that you are the God of small numbers as much as the God of vast crowds and congregations. We thank you that you deign quite gladly to meet with us in the twos and threes as much as in the thousands. We thank you, O Lord, that it is with the twos and threes that you're often able to do so much more than we could ever ask or think or imagine. Pray then, Lord, that you would uh, deepen your work in our lives as a congregation. Sanctify us, O Lord. Each of us um, is so desperately in need of your ongoing sanctifying grace by your Spirit to be conformed evermore to the image of your Son, who is the very likeness of your glory and your majesty. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would be pleased to uh, enable each of us to, to strive to grow in holiness and in love for you and for each other. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace in our midst, that we would be lovers of the brethren, that we would see ourselves of seeking first the good of those who are among us as fellow congregants, rather than seeking our own good and our own will and our own way. And above all, O oh Lord, we pray that you would so use this congregation of which we are a part, um, that your kingdom may come and your blessings may be poured out and your will be done, not only in us and through us, but around us in this village where you've placed us and beyond. For Jesus' sake, amen. I want you to turn back to the passage that we read from uh, this evening and focus especially upon verses 36 and 37 of the, uh, the end there of, of chapter 4 of the book of Acts. Uh, let me read it again to you. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. 
going to look at Barnabas tonight. Every so often, I think it's good for us as congregations, good for us as preachers, um, to do some character studies um, in the pages of Holy Scripture. It's significant that, uh, that we are not merely um, provided by God with a book that's um, like a, th a systematic theology, uh, where there is theology on every page uh, in its purest form. Uh, no, if, if you want a book on theology, then you need to buy a book on theology. Yes, the Bible is full of doctrine, um, and it's doctrine that makes us wise unto salvation, as the Apostle tells us. Um, but it's given to us in a narrative form. Um, it is the unfolding history of redemption from the beginning of Genesis right through to the very end of Revelation. We find the story of salvation with all its aspects and all its complexities and all its wonder spelled out for us in anticipation through the pages of the Old Testament in, uh, as a matter of record in the Gospels and then by way of explanation and exposition in the book of Acts to some extent, but especially in the letters and into the book of Revelation. Uh, but but in, in the course of, of our journey through the Bible, we meet all kinds of people. Um, and we are told that, that their names and their biographies, whether they be long or short, are included in the pages of Holy Scripture for the benefit of the generations that would follow. Uh, that God's work in their lives individually and their God, their God's work through their life and witness, specifically, uh, would be the means of, of instructing the church down through the ages, of equipping the saints down through the ages, and blessing us and enabling us for God's work down through the ages. And, and I think part of the, 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 the reason for that, the rationale for God revealing himself in this way, um, is in order that we might, might realize um, that God brings the truth of who he is and, and all that he does, and especially um, his glorious work of redemption, um, he, he, he portrays it to us in the context of lives that have been made new by his grace. In the lives of those who, like Jacob, um, who we read of earlier on is, uh, uh, was uh, someone, who, who, um, someone who was a privileged, born into a pri privileged position, um, but, but he squandered the blessings that God had given to him in, in a multitude of ways. Um, and and uh, we see the way in which God turned his life around. And if he, God can turn a Jacob around, he can turn any one of us around to be what he wants us to be. So Jacob um, was given a new name the, the night that he wrestled with God at Peniel, uh, whenever he found himself um, embroiled in this, in this uh, wrestling match uh, with a, a, an unseen figure uh, in the hours of darkness. Uh, and and uh, in the course of that, his hip was dislocated um, but he, he was pleading with God for blessing. And, and God's response whenever, uh, whenever dawn broke and, and God made it plain that he had been, Jacob had been wrestling with the Almighty himself, said, your name is going to be changed and, and you're now going to be called Jacob. And um, you are going to be changed into a new man because of my grace. Find several instances of the Bible where names are changed um, on account of a, a reputation that has been earned through the life of the individuals uh, in question. And I want us to look at one in particular, and of course, it's it's um, it's Barnabas. Um, it, it was a mark of, I think, deep um, deep respect um, on the part of of God towards this particular individual, and and of God's grace towards him that that this this man. Um, was, was called by the apostles Barnabas. His original name was, was Joseph. That was the name that he was given at birth. Um, but we are told that whenever he became a Christian, in those early days after the day of Pentecost, um, God gave him a new name. Sorry, the apostles gave him a new name because of the way that he behaved um, as part of the New Testament church in its earliest days. And of course, they... The name Barnabas that the apostles gave to him was 
son of encouragement. Son of encouragement. That he was there in that rapidly growing congregation there in Jerusalem, um, where, uh, which wasn't comprised of, of perfect saints. It was, it was comprised of redeemed sinners. Um, that that they, they came into the new fellowship of the, the congregation of the Lord's people, warts and all. Um, conversion does not mean immediate sanctification. It doesn't mean that a person is immediately made perfect. Yes, the promise is there that one day when God has completed his work in the lives of his children, we will be made perfect in holiness. We'll be a perfect reflection of the incarnate Christ himself who is the, the very essence of the true humanity. So here was, here was Joseph, who, when he was converted and became part of the church, was nicknamed Barnabas. Perhaps initially, whenever they began to call him by that name, there was a kind of wry smile on the face of the apostles as they, they looked at this young man and said, Barnabas, because they, they knew exactly what that name meant, uh, what the meaning was that was bound up with that, that label that was given to him. Because, and, and, and he's flagged up here in, in the book of Acts, I think particularly because he embodies the kind of spirit which ought to pervade every church. He embodies the kind of spirit that should pervade every congregation. Every church needs a Barnabas. Every Christian in every church needs to look long and hard at Barnabas and say, what can I learn from this man? Am I a son of encouragement or am I a son of discouragement? Am I there to help people and, 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 uh, and, and impel people to move forward uh, and to, to be a model of the kind of life and service that um, should be devoted to the life of the church? Or am I there as a fault finder and, and, and somebody who is forever finding problems rather than finding solutions? Well, Barnabas was the great encourager, and as we follow the different references to him in the course of New Testament revelation, it's really quite striking to see how he earned this epithet, but even more significantly, all the way through his life and service, as it's recorded for us, he lives up to that nickname that was given to him, that wherever he went, whoever he was with, whatever circumstances he faced, he was there to see what was good and what was commendable and what would be the means of blessing. Going through various passages that I think bear this out for us where he is mentioned by name, um, we can see four things. Uh, we can see in the first place that he did not have a suspicious mind. We can see in the second place that he had a heart, especially for new disciples, new converts. Thirdly, we see that he had a self-sacrificing spirit, putting others before himself as he sought to serve. And then fourthly, he was a man of principle, not prejudice. And each of those facets of what made Barnabas a Barnabas, a son of encouragement, um, are there for our instruction. Elsewhere in Corinthians, um, Paul speaks about about. Um, particular figures from the Old Testament especially, but true also of the New Testament, uh, glimpses of characters that were involved in the church, who were involved with Christ during his earthly ministry. They are, they are given for exa as examples to us, that they are role models that we are to ponder, to learn from, and to emulate. So let's look at each of these different facets in turn. First of all, turning to Acts um, chapter 9 and verse 27, Acts 9 and verse 27, we see that he did not have a suspicious mind. There we read um, <clears throat> verse 26, and, and when, the, when he had come to Jerusalem, um, this is the recently converted Saul of Tarsus, and when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly 
in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to to Tarsus. He didn't have a suspicious mind. After the the brief glimpse that we are given in the earlier chapters of the book of Acts of the the communal life of the church, um, the next person that we meet after the conversion of Saul of Tarsus is Barnabas. And um, he is the one, we are told by Luke, who, who presents Saul of Tarsus to the apostles in Jerusalem. He himself acts as his, his, um, his, his supporter and, and one who will vouch for him, having been an eyewitness to what had happened uh, there in Damascus when he was brought to saving faith. And, and of course, what the most striking thing about this was that, that he thought the best about this man, not the worst. He thought the best about him. That that even though there was good reason to be suspicious of Saul's conversion, after all, he was on a murder mission when he was on his way to Damascus. He had had, um, letters from the Pharisees and the religious leaders in Jerusalem that explicitly authorized him to incarcerate the Christians and to persecute the Christians and even, as Saul had already been involved with, to see the Christians put to death. So he was an enemy of the church. He, he, was a, he was a declared enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so in one sense, hardly surprisingly, um, not only those in Damascus, but also the, those in Jerusalem, the church leaders, the apostles in Jerusalem, had, had every reason to be suspicious and say, this, this can't be the case. We, we can't just take this at face value. But of course, for Barnabas, who had such a close relationship with the apostles from the very beginning, for Barnabas to say, I will vouch for him. I, I, will, I will tell you what I've seen. I'll tell you what I've heard. Um, and, and I will stand up for this man, for him to, uh, to represent and commend Saul of Tarsus to the apostles in Jerusalem was a significant thing. He literally stuck his neck out, stuck his neck out for the sake of grace and for mercy. You know, the bane of church life through the ages and the bane of so many congregations' life throughout the world is a spirit which is always suspicious and instinctively thinks the worst. And in that sense, it lacks the hallmark, the defining mark of every true Christian who has experienced the love of God in redemption. One of the hallmarks of love, according to the Apostle Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 6 and 7, is, is that love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, that is not for a moment saying that love um, makes us take leave of our senses or or makes us um, careless and indifferent in the judgments that we offer, but it does mean that we will believe the best and hope for the best rather than assume the worst all the time. That there can be an unhealthy negativity in the life of congregations that becomes like a cancer that erodes and eats away at the heart of spirituality among God's people and is damaging to that bond of love that is meant to define us and mark us out as the people of God. Barnabas was not for a moment naive about sin and its reality and its damage, not just to the individual, but the damage that it does to any group of people, family of God's people but he was more enamored by grace because it is grace that has conquered sin. It is not human effort that overcomes sin. It's divine grace that has not only dealt with sin once for all at unspeakable cost on the cross, 
but it deals with sin by God's Holy Spirit, the sanctifying Spirit, working in the hearts of the redeemed to enable us to put sin to death, to crucify the flesh in order that we might live unto God in Christ's resurrection power. That's, that's what shaped the way that Barnabas thought and how he evaluated those around him, and he manifested it in such a wonderful way with Saul of Tarsus. They, um, uh, the one who, a Muslim convert in, in Cambridge Presbyterian Church, once described as the Osama bin Laden of the New Testament world. That's what Saul of Tarsus was. He was hell-bent on terrorizing the church and destroying the church, and yet God was able to save the Osama bin Laden of the ancient world and turn him into an altogether different individual. And Barnabas played a very key part in enfolding him into the life of the, the church and the expansion of the church through the missionary journeys. Second thing that comes out in verses 22 and uh, of, chapter, of Acts chapter 11 and uh, verse 2 of Acts chapter 13 is that he had a heart for new disciples. So in, in Acts chapter 11 and verse 22, um, uh, we, we read the, the, the report, um, well, the, the church, the, 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 the cha earlier on in the chapter, it says in verse 19 that those who have been scattered because of persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. So there was a very narrow focus in terms of who the gospel was being taken to. But then we are told um, of a, a great number believing and turning to the Lord, and the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and what did they do? They sent Barnabas to Antioch, where this mass conversion had taken place. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. These next two instances of the name of, of um, Barnabas being mentioned uh, marks him out as a true ambassador for Christ, that he was there to disciple new converts and to be at the forefront of the missionary expansion of the church into other lands. He had an eye for those who had just come to faith in order that he might come alongside them, take them under his wing, nurture them, and help them to find their feet as baby Christians. But more than that, his eye was always further afield. Where's the next opening going to come? Where's the next place we can go and take this glorious message of redemption? It's not just our age in history when coming into church increasingly feels unnatural and unnerving for the average person around us. Even in our once Christianized Northern Ireland, there is, there's a vast number of people who have got no idea what church is like, and they are scared to come through the doors of a church because they don't know what it's like to be inside. They have perhaps never been in a church or perhaps their memories of church from childhood are bad memories. So to, so to actually physically come through the doors into this building, find their way into the sanctuary, it's all completely unfamiliar to them. It was very much the case um, in, in pagan London when we were there all those years ago, in a very, a very secular society, a very anti-Christian, in many ways, community. And, and as the many churches in London were seeking to reach out with the gospel, to win converts, to plant new churches, and, and, and we um, tried to, to wrestle with the question, well, how do we relate to these people who are, who are so far away from the world in which we live? And, and it was often pointed out, reverse the roles for a moment, and you think of what it would be like for us as Christians to step into what is normal in their world as pagans in the 21st century world. Think of what it would be like to go into a betting shop. You know, I wouldn't have a clue what to do if I walked through the doors of a betting shop. How are you supposed to act? Who are you to speak to? 
What, what exactly are you meant to do once you get inside? Well, if that's true in terms of us trying to penetrate their world, then think of them coming from that kind of environment into our kind of world. How do we make it easier for them to feel at home amongst what to them is an alien people with an alien lifestyle? That's exactly what Barnabas does. He, he helps these new converts in the pagan world of the Greek and Roman Empire, and, and he takes them by the hand and says, let me, let me make it easy for you to meet these Christians who are now your brothers and sisters and to understand what goes on whenever they gather for worship, to make sense of it. You're, you're too often we just take it for granted. Everybody knows what happens when we go through a service of worship. But sometimes it's good for the pastor to actually explain each step along the way. What, what, is the, what is the logic that is bound up with the way in which we begin with a call to worship and with a prayer to God to come and be in our midst? What is the logic of our first act to being singing the praise of God, a prayer of adoration, a, a hymn of adoration followed by a prayer of adoration and confession of sin? Each step, each component of the liturgy of any true church is meant to be uh, a re-articulation of that journey from our lostness to the glory of the heaven to which we are bound in the act of engaging with God. Well, that's what Barnabas did. And the one thing that makes, the one thing more than anything else that makes a church user-friendly, to borrow a cliche from church life in so many places today, we are being encouraged again and again, churches need to be user-friendly. Well, the most basic thing to having a user-friendly church is to have friendly users. You know, so that there's a, and here's a challenge for all of us. Maybe I've issued this challenge before, but let me issue it again. That, that before, as when, the, when the benediction is pronounced and, and you're all set to, to exit the church, but you look around as to whom you should speak to, you instinctively want to speak to somebody you know to pick up on a friendship that already exists. But if you perchance see one who is a, someone who's a stranger, make a beeline for the stranger. Welcome to someone that, that someone who is there for the first time and say, we're just delighted to see you here tonight. You're, you're more than welcome. If, 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 let, let's tell you about our church or let you tell us about yourselves. Just begin to build a relationship. Because as we build those relationships, they become the building blocks of the church itself that in the goodness of God will in some cases lead to conversion or in other cases providing uh, a direction for some Christian who's looking for a, a church home. That's exactly what Barnabas was. His ability to strike up a rapport with those who had recently come to faith and to engage with those who had never heard. It wasn't a matter of technique. It was simply a matter of, of attitude towards others and the willingness to take that first step. Don't wait for people to come to you, but you take the first step to welcome and to encourage and bless. Third thing that comes out, uh, which we see from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and, and, and verse uh, 6, um, is the fact that he had a self-sacrificing spirit. 1 Corinthians um, 9 and verse 6, or Acts 4 verse 37, first of all, um, there we, we are, we are told in Acts 4, verse 37, that, that, um, that, that Barnabas, this son of encouragement, native of Cyprus, whenever a, a, a financial need arose within the church, we are told he sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. You know, his encouragement didn't come simply through what he said with his lips. His encouragement came through his willingness to take out his checkbook and say, here's, here's something towards the needs of this congregation, this particular need that's arisen at this particular time. So again, in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 9 and, and verse 6, what do we read there? Um, Is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? What was Paul saying there um, in, in that case? Um, you know, Paul, um, Paul was primarily a missionary for the gospel. 
Um, and, and, and in that sense, he depended upon the, the fledgling New Testament church to provide a stipend for him, which varied. It varied from place to place, from circumstance to circumstance. There was, there was no presbytery at that time um, that was uh, organizing the finances of the different congregations. Um, so it was, it, Paul was, was, would say, say elsewhere that there's times when he did not know where the next meal was coming from. But as a Pharisee, and in his earlier life, he would have learned a trade. And we know what his trade was. It was tent making. And we know that in some places where Paul went on his missionary journeys, he was preaching the gospel by day, and he was making tents by night. And he was presumably selling his tents the next day somewhere in the market. He was supporting himself. But he was willing to do that for the sake of Christ and for the, the spread of the gospel. And we find that, that when he and Barnabas um, were, were facing the challenges um, of, of, the, of fulfilling their calling as missionaries, they did not bat an eyelid at the thought of, we'll pay the way ourselves to do this. So important is this work, so valuable is the, the goal of proclaiming Christ to the world that we ourselves will support ourselves in order to ensure that this work isn't hindered. So by day they preached the gospel, by night they were making tents and living off the proceeds. His regard for what he owned financially was nothing in compared to what he possessed in salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. It was, it was no isolated gesture, as we've said already, on the part of Barnabas. Uh, and when we hear of his labors with Paul, he also went as a self-supporting missionary. And, and that self-sacrifice wasn't just um, manifest um, in what went into the offering box, um, but in his readiness to give of himself his time and his energy for God. That's why whenever we welcome new members into the congregation, one of the questions that we'll put to them at the very end of that list of questions by which they have the opportunity to publicly pr profess their faith and, and their willingness to submit to the oversight of the church is, are you willing to give of your time, talents, and money for the good of the church and the spread of the gospel? Are you prepared to make not just a nominal commitment, but to actually commit yourselves and the gifts that God has given to you for the good of the witness of this church and the well-being of the congregation. And of course, that kind of spirit, which isn't a self-serving spirit, it's the spirit of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and seeking the good of others among whom God has placed us. remember taking part in a conference in St. George's Tron in Edinburgh uh, back in the time when Sinclair Ferguson was the, the pastor there. Um, and, and it was a, a big conference and a number of us were there as speakers. Um, and uh, uh, they, they, at, at the end of it, um, we were quietly passed an envelope, an envelope which had come from a free will offering that had been available at the end of the conference in the, uh, it, to, the, to those who had gathered. And Sinclair smiled whenever he saw what he was handing over to each of us who had contributed and participated. And he said, isn't it wonderful that those whose calling it is, is to bless the church through the preaching of God's word and the pastoring of God's people, are blessed by the church, by the people of God, in the act of that simple gesture of a gift, of a support. That when we have that self-sacrificing spirit, it's actually an upbuilding spirit in the congregation as a whole. That we live not for what we can get, but for what we can give and how we can bless those around us. But then finally, uh, from Galatians chapter uh, 2 and, and verse 1, we discover that he was, he was a man of principle and not of prejudice, a man of principle and not of 
prejudice. Galatians 2, verse 1, it says, Then after 14 years, um, I went up again. Paul had been away in Arabia for some time. After 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, that is the leaders, though privately before those who seemed to be influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in those who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Jesus Christ so that they might bring us into slavery. To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment. So here was Paul and, and he was being falsely accused of distorting the gospel. That other members of the church, other leaders in the church who still were governed by their Jewish prejudice and didn't like the idea of... of um, of the gospel being taken to the Gentile community, they turned on Paul, they accused him falsely of having breached his calling as uh, an apostle of Christ and a missionary of the gospel, and, and they were going to make life difficult for him. It, it was a bit like a situation that we encountered in, in South Armagh whenever we were living in Rich Hill the first time at the height of the Troubles, uh, that we knew that there was a particular CEF worker um, who was um, doing great work in some of the Republican estates in Armagh and, and seeing not just work with children but Bible studies with family members taking place and people coming to faith. And a member of an evangelical church in Armagh City to, whom, to which this, individual, this, this CEF worker belonged was quietly told one day, if you continue to take the gospel into that estate, I will tip the IRA off and you will not last another minute. The idea on the part of a Protestant of the gospel being taken to the Roman Catholic community was anathema. That's, that's a picture of what's going on here in the way that Paul is being accused for having somehow betrayed the gospel by preaching it to Gentiles. And, and Barnabas could very easily, out of a spirit of self-protection, say, Paul, you're on your own this time. Instead, he said, Paul, I'm by your side. If they take you down, you're going to take me down as well. Because I'm with you all the way in what you've done in obedience to the Great Commission. It was an issue of principle. When many people in the church at that time were driven by a party spirit, by a Judaistic, Pharisaical spirit within the Christian church, prejudice prevailed. Barnabas was prepared to stand shoulder to shoulder with his dear friend Paul. And even though it was Paul who stood in the front line, Barnabas wasn't afraid because of the issue at stake in order to support him. And that can only have encouraged enormously. I'm sure there was a, a wry smile on Paul's face whenever Barnabas sidled up to him and said, brother, I'm with you. Don't be afraid. I'll vouch for you. It's never easy to take a principled stand, to act on the basis of what is morally right and required by God's word. We could be driven by the, by, by the crowd spirit. If everybody else is doing it, I'll join in. I don't want to be the odd person out. But there's times whenever sometimes you have to stand up and be counted. Your voice needs to be heard so that what is right, what is true, what is good, what is pure, what is honoring to God is upheld and pursued by God's people. But perhaps most striking of all, the Lord Jesus Christ needed that encouragement and that support. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane. The Lord Jesus Christ, in anticipation of the cross, is so crushed in spirit that he is disintegrating physically. It's affecting him. It's affecting his, his very physiology. And, and he is gasping and he is crying and, and he is bowed down at the prospect of Calvary. And what does God do? God sends an encourager from heaven, an angel, to stand by him, to put his arm around Jesus and say, my Lord, let me, let me comfort you in this hour of need. You know what the most frequent exhortation we find 
in the New Testament as we listen to the epistles and not only the doctrine that they apply, uh, that they expound, but the application of that doctrine. The recurring words are these, encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. That we are to make it our business not to pick each other apart, but to actually build one another up. Not to look for the worst, but to encourage the best. And to do so standing shoulder to shoulder, side by side, as those who are engaged in the same mission and have the privilege of pursuing that same calling to glorify Christ in our midst and to proclaim Christ by all means to those who are around us, that even just some might be saved. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the encouragement we find in this man who was called Son of Encouragement. And we pray, O Lord, that it might be imprinted upon our hearts and upon our minds in terms of how we conduct ourselves, how we relate to those around us in the church, how we welcome those who come in for the first time to the church. We pray, O Lord, that there may be an overwhelming spirit of warmth and welcome, even to strangers, because we know that we are told that when we entertain strangers, at times we are showing hospitality to angels unbeknown to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.